Welcome back to the research track. Um, good afternoon or good whatever time it is for you. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Stephen Jonas. Dr. Jonas is a pediatric physician scientist and assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine and California Nanosystems Institute. His multidisciplinary research team targets the development and application of new technologies and methods to support the children's health and regenerative medicine research com communities in accelerating the discovery and implementation of emerging gene and cellular therapeutic approaches and precision medicine-based diagnostic tools. A primary focus of this research explores strategies for improving how gene therapies are manufactured through the design of nanotechnologies that enable rapid, safe, cost-effective, and efficient delivery of genes and genome editing machinery. Dr. Jonas is now going to present on nanotechnologies to enable cystic fibrosis gene therapies. Welcome, Dr. Jonas. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and it's uh, great to be with you all virtually. Uh, thank you, Julie, for the kind introduction and uh, to the CFRI for organizing this wonderful meeting. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet and, and learn from this research community and the invitation to share a little bit of uh, what we've been exploring today. Uh, my only disclosure is really concern uh, intellectual property associated with our research that's been assigned to the regents of the University of California. And without that out of the way, um, just a little bit about me. I guess I'm a little bit of an odd duck as a pediatric physician scientist uh, because, you know, leveraging uh, my background in material science and, uh, and nanoscience, uh, I've been fortunate enough at UCLA uh, to be empowered uh, throughout my training uh, and really beyond to engage across uh, disciplines uh, with colleagues from either the bioengineering and physical science community to experts in uh, stem cell biology and regenerative medicine and explore, you know, uh, the ultimate limits of miniaturization with our uh, colleagues on the front lines uh, of patient care uh, to look at how we can uh, take advantage of these uh, uh, of these approaches to create new toolkits for interacting with cells in different ways. Uh, we've kind of nicknamed the group the UCLA Nanotransformers because uh, this is an effort that really originated from our interest in designing nanotechnology enabled methods uh, to explore uh, how we can maybe transform cells for therapeutic applications. Uh, but the inside joke is that, you know, don't let uh, my bosses at UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital uh, know about this because the transformers are actually a Hasbro toy. Uh, but jokes aside, uh, my group, uh, as Julie mentioned, focuses on targeting the development of technologies for streamlining uh, the generation of new gene and cell therapeutics, um, uh, which will be the primary focus of the remainder of the presentation uh, in the context of our work targeting solutions for CF gene therapies. So when we think about um, cellular ther the cell therapy space, whether you consider gene therapies like those that my colleague and clinical mentor Don Cohn has pioneered for various immunodeficiencies and hematopathies. Uh, hematologic disorders, or in a, the adoptive cell therapy space within pediatric oncology, uh, or, you know, for gene therapies directed at CF, uh, the thing that really strikes me is that the common uh, uh, thread that really connects all of these areas together is that at some point, for a lot of cells, you need to deliver some kind of gene or gene editing package to, you know, a specific and usually large population of cells quickly, efficiently, safely and you know ultimately economically you know this is a, a considerable challenge to establishing robust gene therapy solutions across the spectrum of children's health not just for cystic fibrosis and part of the challenge that my group hopes to contribute to solving is how we might address existing disparities in accessing these inter interventions down the road uh, in terms of the cost in terms of addressing the speed and effectiveness of manufacturing these treatments and and, and ultimately how we might accelerate the, uh, uh, the broader deployment of these uh, interventions to underserved communities globally. So we think part of the solution is establishing a better biomolecular supply chain or delivery service, if you will. It's kind of a different uh, from you know, the supply, issue, supply chain issues that you know, have been in the news recently. And hopefully uh, no one here has encountered or been affected by any of the annoying shortages of uh, uh, critical supplies or, and reagents in your labs. Uh, but 
we see uh, a similar dilemma in really in producing cell therapeutics where you know, mass producing and translating uh, new gene therapy solutions for clinical use uh, really becomes a question of discovering uh, the appropriate therapeutic cargoes, uh, packaging them, and delivering them to large populations of cells, again, efficiently, rapidly, safely, and cost-effectively. And it's obviously impractical to charge upwards of $500,000 per dose for a gene therapy. Um, and, you know, but this is where we think that uh, we some of the solutions that we can come at, up with, with from a bioengineering perspective, uh, can help address um, some of this, some of these challenges. Uh, for these roadblocks in the supply chain, uh, our work really focuses on on the packaging and the delivery component of the work um, uh, to produce uh, uh, the therapeutic vehicles for um, delivering uh, the gene therapies. And so we sort of liken, you know, our our role in this in 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 in, in this effort to you know, something that like what Amazon or, or, or FedEx plays in our everyday lives, where uh, there are a lot of brilliant scientists all over the world designing different cargoes uh, that we hope to be able to work with. But what's made Amazon uh, and FedEx so indispensable and so useful in our lives is that they've, you know, figured out how to basically put things in nice packages and to deliver them uh, to you efficiently. And so our goal really is to offer the nanoscale version of these solutions. You know, most clinical grade uh, cell therapeutic uh, clinical approaches uh, have really relied on viral vector based approaches for um, uh, uh, engineering different types of cell products. And while these types of strategies have really enabled this field um, and have been decently reliable, they tend to fall short in terms of you know, some important considerations like cargo capacity, uh, potential immunogenicity, and they add currently uh, considerable uh, cost to the manufacturing in, in terms of manufacturing uh, uh, different types of therapeutic vehicles. Uh, Non-viral based approaches such as electroporation or liquefaction similarly suffer from issues with either vari variable viability, cell type or instrumentation dependence, or even scalability. And so really, in our minds, developing a technology that can simultaneously achieve GMP compliance universal cargo delivery efficient uh, that can and can do that efficiently uh, at high throughput and mi with minimal toxicity sustainable operation and, and scalability is uh, remains a long term challenge um, in, in, in the gene therapy space. So we're actively developing a portfolio of, 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 of nanotechnology enabled uh, methods to address these challenges that either use uh, biophysical membrane permeabilization strategies. Uh, that are based on rapid membrane deformation or either sharp or, or sharp nanostructures to, to penetrate cellular membranes. Uh, I think it's really important here to emphasize that we want to be multifaceted uh, because uh, uh, I really don't think that there's really going to be a, a universal solution uh, for intracellular delivery um, for any clinical application, in particular uh, cystic fibrosis. So for some types of cells, for example, uh, uh, they might be amenable to one technique over another. Um, in the context of CF, uh, it might be useful to have systems that uh, enable inhaled delivery of gene therapy cargos to address the major sites associ uh, associated with uh, the morbidity and, and mortality uh, in patients with, with this disease. And so really the concept of, of nebulized or aerosol-based inhalable gene therapies for CF is, is really certainly not new. And existing approaches have uh, had some success in, in early phase trials, but these platforms have tended to be limited in their ability to access and achieve robust long-term correction of airway basal stem cell populations that are tend to be located underneath the, the, the fully differentiated mucociliary epithelium, and so far have lacked you know, the key design features that we just discussed in the previous slides uh, in terms of providing an efficient cargo agnostic and, and, and scalable solution that can be translated to the clinic. And so ad to address this challenge, uh, that's really what's brought our, our multidisciplinary team here at UCLA together, uh, where together with my colleagues, uh, uh, Bridget Gompertz, who brings expertise in, in the biology of airway stem cells, and Don Cohn, who I mentioned earlier, who's a pioneer in advancing the development of gene therapies to the clinic, we're interested in exploring uh, whether we can you know, basically make an inhalable gene editing toolkit to enable uh, gene therapies for cystic fibrosis. And our goal is really to improve access with these tools is to improve access um, 
and uh, deliver CRISPR-based uh, uh, CFTR gene, gene insertion constructs to the airway basal stem cells that ultimately will support the development of a, a corrected mucociliary epithelium. Before we get into the delivery and packaging, I want to briefly talk, uh, give you an overview of uh, uh, the, uh, the, our plans to design cargos for CFTR correction. And so the cargos uh, of interest for our, 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 our different approach, delivery approaches is, uh, are really based on the CRISPR-Cas9 nucleus, nucleus system. And so those of you out there in the audience are probably no strangers to this technology and the capabilities that has offered uh, for um, uh, genome editing and, and modification. And, and you know, from my basic understanding, uh, in essence, we take a programmable uh, single guide RNA uh, sequence that is able to direct a Cas9 nuclease to make a, a specific cut um, uh, in a uh, result that results in a double-stranded break at a specific site in the genome. And then depending on the intrinsic DNA repair mechanisms uh, that are applied by the cells that are targeted, uh, the double-stranded break can either essentially be patched uh, via non-homologous end joining uh, mediated um, processes that result in gene disruption or in homology directed repair based uh, pathway, if that's favored, then the uh, introduction of a complementary DNA template or a donor can be introduced uh, at the location specified by the double stranded break uh, to enable editing or, or gene insertion or correction. So ideally we wanna take the latter approach in designing uh, gene editing reagents for CFTR correction. And like many of the, the groups uh, in this field, our strategy basically relies on making a cut at, at a specific site of the CFTR gene and then inserting the donor, uh, a donor really designed uh, with homology arms uh, to the adjoining ends of the double uh, stranded break region uh, to insert and, and repair a DNA sequence of choice. Uh, this work is really led by uh, Paul Ayub, who's a talented grad student in Don Cohn's lab, and who is really our gene editing uh, guru. And he shared a couple of slides with me to highlight the direction that he's taking. Uh, the focus of Paul's work has, has really been uh, so far to design uh, CFTR gene editing cargos for our, 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 our eventually nano nanoparticle packages uh, that optimize uh, uh, their ability to cut at specific regions at CFTR. Uh, that will allow for correction of a majority of CF causing mutations uh, to engineer donor constructs to achieve uh, CFTR gene correction and insertion that we need uh, that we're uh, hoping to exploit and uh, while also minimizing um, uh, off-target cutting uh, and uh, developing in vitro tools uh, that will help us validate uh, our, 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 our nanotechnologies uh, moving forward. So Paul's initial strategy applied uh, guide RNAs designed to really cut within the five prime uh, untranslated region of the CFTR. Uh, and we've used the T84 cell line as a model for these pilot studies, where Paul's applied tide bait sequencing to assess for on-target cutting. Uh, he's also compared the delivery of these gene editing constructs using two different commercial electroporation systems and electroporation enhancing reagents and compared them to lip affection systems to really benchmark his guides uh, and donors and provide us which, with uh, an additional benchmark for uh, the, uh, the nanotechnologies that we're hoping to develop in our group. Uh, to be honest, you know, uh, in our hands, the T84 cells are not our favorite cell line. So I'd love to speak with any of the folks out there uh, who uh, can maybe point us to an alternative uh, system that we might be able to consider uh, as we kind of move our work forward. Uh, to try and increase uh, editing efficiency, we've learned that we need to re uh, reconfigure our guides to target different locations within the CFTR. Um, so. Uh, our currently best performing guides uh, have, uh, that we've identified from this, these surveys uh, are designed to cut within intron one of CFTR. And these guides appear to be more efficient while still being capable of mediating uh, uh, the gene correction for uh, a majority of, 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 the, of, of, of the CF causing mutations for, uh, that are present in patients. Uh, we're also um, with these guides set out to you know, establish what the safety profile of, of, of the guides are by performing a uh, preliminary off-target analysis in the T84 cells using GuideSeq, which is a, a technique uh, that uh, detects off-target effects of CRISPR-Cas9 uh, based edits um, uh, at, within the genome uh, at, the, at the nucleotide level uh, by exploiting a combination of essentially uh, uh, unbiased amplification and next-generation sequencing. 
uh, our initial analysis uh, of, of the guides uh, that Paul's designed have uh, 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 revealed that there's there, that we do see some off-target cutting uh, within the Intron One region, uh, but uh, with, with with the Intron One with within the Intron One guides. Um, however, um, none of the off-target uh, that we've measured so far. Uh, uh, we're within two megabases of known oncogenic or, or tumor suppressor genes. So taken together, we think that uh, the intron one guides that uh, uh, he's designed so far offer a better performance over our original five prime UTR targeting sequences. And that's what we're going to be incorporating into our um, uh, to our nanoparticles moving forward. You know, given the size of the CT CFTR uh, gene coding region, which is about 4.4 kilobases, our DNA donor constructs are really limited to either nanoplasmid, uh, plasmid, nanoplasmid, or double-stranded uh, DNA-based architectures. And so we've surveyed these different configurations, and at least in, in, in our hands, the double-stranded DNA donors uh, fail, uh, fared uh, uh, the best in terms of both integration and toxicity when compared to plasmid and nanoplasmid um, counterparts. Uh, the integration efficiencies that we've observed in these initial tests, though, uh, have been relatively low for clinical efficacy, where we want to shoot for closer to about 10% uh, uh, for uh, uh, CFDR insertion for clinical benefit. And so to begin to address this issue, uh, we're exploring how we might modify the donor templates by either altering the size of the homology arms uh, to remove either promoter sequence and ultimately minimize their size, or by chemically modifying the five prime uh, end of the homology arm with linker molecules comprised of an amine group that are tethered to uh, a carbon chain based on a strategy reported by Human Zhao and colleagues at, 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 at the University of Illinois. And so, so far, we've you know, observed that chemically modified donors with 500 base pair uh, homology arms displayed uh, a two-fold increase in the integration efficiency over our plasmid donors. Uh, but we're continuing to explore additional strategies to improve the performance of these reagents as we move forward. Um, to accelerate the validation of, uh, our, of our nanotechnologies, Paul's also been working diligently to generate a CFTR uh, knockout uh, T84 line that'll help us ultimately establish screening assays uh, as we've merged our efforts to package CFTR gene editing, editing cargos in uh, different nanoscale uh, delivery, in our different nanoscale delivery vehicles. Uh, as we refine our gene editing cargos um, uh, continuously, the, the next real big question is, is, is whether we can build a better shipping container for them and to get them uh, ultimately to their intended destination. When you think about um, the nanoscale packaging solutions that are out there for gene editing reagents, we focus primarily on applying uh, either lipid nanoparticle-based strategies uh, that are similar to those employed in you know, the recent mRNA COVID-19 vaccines uh, from Pfizer and Moderna, uh, as well as uh, in dendromeric supermolecular-based nanocarriers. And these uh, nanocarrier platforms uh, both offer similar synthetic uh, uh, versatility, uh, as well as the ability to accommodate different types of cargos. And we can tailor uh, their cargo carrying capacity uh, by, by fine tuning their synthesis for different types of applications. Um, together uh, with my colleague H.R. Sang, uh, we've explored the use of nanoparticle systems that you know, uh, self-assemble into dendromer like nets around biomolecular cargos via host guest chemistries uh, between adamantane and cyclodextran containing uh, uh, molecular building blocks. And the advantage of this kind of system is that it's pretty cargo agnostic, uh, where you know, both nucleic acids and proteins can uh, be loaded into the, uh, to the particles relatively straightforwardly. And the resulting particles uh, can ultimately be incorporated with functionalities to improve cell penetration, uh, nuclear trafficking, or add other functions uh, uh, to enhance delivery uh, um, uh, 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 when applied to different types of systems. You know, to give you an idea of the cargo versatility uh, of this type of supermolecular platform, uh, our, in our oncology-related efforts, together with Andras Heshi and his group at Baylor, we're in early stages of optimizing uh, the delivery of a Sleeping Beauty-based chimeric antigen receptor expression construct uh, 
uh, that we've packaged into supermolecular nanoparticles to enable stable integration to human T cell populations. That coupled with our more, some of our other recent work um, where we've begun to apply uh, this system to deliver gene editing reagents uh, to a variety for a variety of applications and disease targets gives us kind of a, a, a wealth of opportunity to kind of engineer different um, particles for different situations. So in these cases where we employ gene editing constructs, uh, we employ a, a basically a two particle system where one nanoparticle set of nanoparticles really uh, is packaged with a Cas9 encoding, pla encoding plasmid or, or mRNA. Uh, and the other contains the donor template uh, for encoding for uh, whatever gene we're trying to insert. Like uh, for in, in, in this case, uh, uh, a gene, uh, a, a cassette encoding for uh, retinal uh, schesin one, uh, deficiencies of which uh, lead to congenital retinal diseases like Liber uh, hereditary optic neuropathy. Uh, with the synthesis methods that we employ, we're able to combinatorially optimize factors like cargo concentration and type, uh, the amount of cell penetrating peptide sequence that we can use, and the ratios of the supermolecular building blocks to identify formulations that ultimately yield uh, uh, optimal transfection efficiencies, in this case in mouse retinal cells. And more recently, we've adapted these kinds of particles to house entire Cas9 ribonucleoprotein complexes rather than just the plasmid constructs to enable the uh, non-homologous and joining uh, mediated uh, gene disruption, in this case, uh, to target sites in the dystrophin gene, which could inform gene therapies for uh, 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 dis dis uh, diseases, disorders like dis Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, uh, as well as to enable homology-directed repair uh, through the introduction of this case, uh, in, in this case of a cassette encoding for the hemoglobin beta uh, to a safe harbor locus in K562 3.21 cells, which harbor the sickle cell mutation. And so we're hoping to take lessons learned from these uh, types of materials and then these studies as we configure and apply our nanoparticles that we specifically target to the CF airway. Uh, in parallel to this work with the supermolecular nanoparticles, uh, we're also hoping, uh, and this is the project that's really led by a, a Ruth Foley, a graduate student in my lab, uh, to ultimately validate the capability of lipid nanoparticles and their ability to deliver similar gene editing cargos um, uh, to CF relevant cell types. Uh, Ruth right now is complexing uh, fluorescent reporter expressing constructs to her lipid nanoparticles and uh, uh, that are comprised of uh, different types of lipid constituents uh, where she's surveying uh, different formulations that can hopefully achieve delivery um, in this case of using T84 cells as a model as well as an airway basal stem cell populations which we'll get into in a little bit. And her best formulations so far uh, have particles that are centered around uh, 130 nanometers uh, where she's currently seeing GFP expression on the order of 40% in the T84 cells, uh, making uh, and, and making continued progress and improvements as, as, uh, as uh, she's fine-tuning these approaches. To accelerate this that aspect of her work um, and to really reduce the batch-to-batch -batch variabilities and the synthesis of the nanocarriers, we've it's begun to leverage advances in microfluidics, where we take advantage of the precise fluid handling capabilities of these systems to control interactions between the different types of nanoparticle uh, building blocks during synthesis and the packaging of the cargos that we want to, to, to load into the particles. Uh, 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 Ruth and Emily uh, are really applying uh, these techniques to tailor nanopar the nanoparticle size and the configuration uh, for both the supermolecular particle system, as well as the lipid nanoparticles, uh, which will enable us to really more quickly assess modifications to these nanocarriers and to automate the synthesis once we identify the best performing formulations. Um, their focus right now is to apply these synthetic methods using microfluidic devices that integrate herringbone geometries that produce chaotic mixing uh, and allow us that allows us to begin to uh, screen for formulations that accom accommodate larger types of cargos. And uh, so far, they've been able to reproducibly synthesize monodispersed uh, lipid nanoparticle uh, populations uh, that uh, are close to our 200 nanometer sweet spot that can co-encapsulate 
both a Cas9 mRNA construct and um, a guide RNA uh, uh, sequence, as well as uh, with lipid nanoparticles that encapsulate ribonuclear protein complexes, which tend to be a little bit bigger, uh, but re still remain monodisperse. And so we expect that we can further kind of fine tune and bring uh, that nanoparticle size down to a uh, between 100 to 200 nanometers uh, in a range that seem, that would be more favorable for endocytosis as we kind of develop uh, the therapeutic tools that uh, we want to uh, be able to deliver to the airway. Uh, to more quickly screen for successful gene editing in our nanoparticle formulations, uh, we designed a T84 reporter cell line that uh, offers a convenient tool for quickly to determining uh, the successful intracellular delivery of gene editing reagents by, by the nanocarriers uh, that's based on a, a protocol uh, and a BFP reporter, set of BFP reporter constructs developed by Jacob Korn and colleagues. The system offers a convenient tool for us that uh, gives us the uh, capability to observe via flow cytometry, either non-homology and joining mediated disruption of uh, the BFP uh, uh, by, by uh, seeing cells that lose their fluorescence, or to confirm the delivery of donors uh, for HDI, HDR mediated repair uh, using payloads designed to convert the stably, a stably integrated BFP reporter to uh, a GFP uh, signal uh, by introducing a, a donor uh, 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 with a three, a nu that inserts a three nucleotide mutation at a, at a specific locus. And before in introducing the complexity of HDR in that case, we've been just been applying the system to test particles uh, that are packaged for uh, with cargos for CRISPR-Cas9 mediated cutting. And uh, in our initial tests so far, we were able to see about five to ten percent loss of fluorescence in the, in the BFP T84s, indicating non-homologous end joining does occur. Um, and we're able to kind of preserve the functionality of the cargos uh, that have been incorporated in the nanoparticles. Uh, while these cutting efficiencies are, are modest so far, we feel that, um, that that this reporter line is going to be an invaluable tool as we move forward uh, to really optimize the nano carriers and the gene editing uh, cargos as we move uh, as 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 we move on. As a quick aside, um, we're also looking at alternative packaging strategies with capability abilities for triggering the release of the cargo from the nanoparticles um, that use a variety of stimuli, such as the application of alternative magnetic fields or even light. And developing these capabilities extend our toolkit even further and may enable us ultimately to release certain cargos for situations uh, where constructs need to be uh, uh, processed by certain cell types and sequence. So that's sort of our ideas for the box, how do we really get these uh, uh, cargos and these packages essentially to their desired location? And so for our ultimate application, uh, we need to a platform that allows us to test whether the nanocarriers can be delivered as nebulized suspensions to, to, to airway cells. And so Bridget's group has really developed an expertise in modeling the airway in vitro using air-liquid interface cultures that are supported on, on, on membrane inserts, um, uh, which I'm going to call ALIs for short because it's a mouthful. Uh, but these, these cellular models really mimic the epithelial structure and organization of the human airway and are, are ideal in our case for studying aerosol-based delivery of the nanoparticles as the topmost layer of cells is exposed to air and accessible to our nebulized suspensions. And they have the added advantage of uh, being compatible with immunofluorescent staining assays that can be applied to identify different mucociliary cell types and or proliferating cells. So by loading the particles into aeroneb vibrating mesh nebulizer units, we've been able to demonstrate um, in initial studies, the delivery of uh, delivery to ALIs using a variety of, uh, 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 where we've observed the GFP expression um, with aerosolized uh, LNPs that are loaded with a GFP expression construct um, in airway basal stem cells before the, they form the, uh, in the ALI a, a full, fully differentiated mucociliar epithelial layer. Uh, these results suggest that we have a good foundation from which to expand our capabilities, but we have a couple of obstacles that we need to overcome. Uh, first, obviously, we want to graduate to delivering uh, gene editing and Cas9-specific uh, uh, cargos using the particles 
using this delivery format. And second, we want to be able to overcome the, one of the biggest challenges to inhaled gene therapies for CF, which is crossing uh, the epithelium to open access to airway basal stem cells. To address this challenge more quickly, we need a way to screen aerosol-based uh, delivery of nanoparticles uh, uh, at, at higher throughput and in a more systematic manner. And the capability uh, like this would really allow us to uh, apply the combinatorial approaches that we've piloted in our prior supramolecular nanoparticle work that I described in uh, a couple slides earlier to rapidly screen for and identify nanocarrier formulations that display the best delivery and gene editing performance. Uh, to do this, we're applying 3D printing and different types of rapid prototyping methods to design and assemble devices that we can uh, use to direct nanoparticle-laden aerosol mists to individual ALIs supported on, uh, uh, on wells of standard uh, culture plates. And our prototype devices right now are, are, are configured for um, 24 well plates, and we're hoping to expand to 96 well formats uh, to increase the throughput of our testing kind of moving further. Uh, the major objective that we're trying to tackle, um, though, is really to overcome the significant physical and immunologic barriers that are imposed by the CF airway. And in, if we can do this, we can gain better access to the, uh, the airway basal stem cells that we need to target for long-term CFTR correction. Um, for this to be successful here, we really need to bypass um, the thick mucus layer um, that's present in the airway of CF patients, as well as the mucociliar epithelium uh, that's uh, rendered largely impermeable by the presence of a lot of tight junctions in that arc cellular architecture. So one of our ideas to gain better access to these self-renewing airway basal stem cell populations is really to leverage the modular design of the nanoparticles and their amenability to be decorated with molecules that uh, uh, may be used ultimately to basically induce a transient disruption or injury at the, at the, at the apical portion of the epithelium. And we're currently exploring for this, nanoparticle systems that integrate surfactant moieties uh, that may offer these features. You know, our initial tests have uh, really focused on uh, the surfactant polydocanol, uh, which group, Bridget's group and others have used routinely uh, to promote sloughing of the airway and to disrupt cell-cell junctions that help form the, the tight epithelial barrier uh, to the luminal cells of the airway in mouse models. Uh, Bridget's group has also shown that inducing changes in reactive oxygen species uh, by using molecules like polydocanol to induce airway injury can influence stem cell self-renewal, which we may be able to exploit for our gene editing work as HDR-mediated repair is cell cycle dependent. And that might be able to, we might be able to hopefully uh, take advantage of that uh, of that ability to fine tune uh, our cargos and our particles um, for these types of situations. Uh, we've hypothesized that due to the amphiphilic structure of this molecule of the polydocanol molecule, uh, that we may uh, uh, that it may participate in the spontaneous self assembly with the nanoparticles and confer uh, basically epithelial penetrating capabilities to the particles uh, and uh, the features that we're looking for. To test this in a an initial pilot study, uh, we began to, uh, that in, that tested nanoparticles that incorporate um, uh, uh, polydopicolon moieties. Uh, we see that um, the invade the the that with the, with the zeta with zeta potential measurements, which in, give us information about. Uh, the different particle uh, particle surface charges, uh, we see a decrease in the zeta potential at with polydo with increasing uh, polydocanol weight percent. This leads us to really hypothesize that what we may be observing is that uh, the polydocanol is either replacing cationic lipids at the surface of the particles, 
with uncharged poly with uncharged polydocanol molecules, or due to ion shielding uh, uh, poly uh, at the shear plane of the particles, uh, the the polydocanol can interact and 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 um, and, and complex with the particles to uh, achieve the effects that we we're looking for. Uh, we're hoping to um, apply. Uh, Cryo TEM uh, microscopy to enable us to visualize the structure of these these uh, surfactant modified uh, lipid nanoparticles uh, directly. But for now, in indirect measurements, we're using dynamic light scattering based techniques. Uh, Ruth's able to see that she's uh, that uh, she can generate small uniform particles uh, that contain up to forty weight percent polydocanol, regardless of the particle of whether the particles are formed uh, using uh, uh, traditional thin film liposome extrusion uh, based methods, or whether we incorporate the polydocanol into the lipid nanoparticles via the aqueous or ethanol phases uh, during microfluidic syntheses. Um, she's also been able to show that particles that uh, polydocanol uh, package particles that also incorporate GFP expressing mRNA constructs uh, can be uh, uh, delivered and retain uh, the GFP expression capability, uh, delivery to deliver uh, uh, functional GFP expression um, cassettes to T84 cells, uh, which we think will be an interesting thing to explore kind of moving forward. Uh, so then the next question is whether these surfactant integrating molecules, uh, particles, influence the impact of, of polydocanol when it's administered to a fully differentiated mucociliary epithelium uh, in, ALA, in, in ALA cultures. Uh, in, in a pilot study here with Bridget's group, um, we've compared the uh, injury and repair of ALIs after treatment with polydocanol as opposed to um, lipid nanoparticles that integrate polydocanol into their structure. And what we've observed is that while uh, polydocanol uh, induces uh, lipid nanoparticles at a similar level uh, uh, of epithelial injury and exposure of, of the stem cells, which you can see here um, in keratin five uh, stained uh, uh, cell uh, using using uh, keratin five stained cells. Epithelial repair uh, was observed in these in the in the lipid nanoparticle uh, containing uh, polydocanol. Uh, reagents uh, that was occurred. Uh, we saw faster repair um, in these ALI structures. So we're now investigating whether you know the brief uh, this brief transient epithelial injury induced by poly the polydocanol LNPs uh, may help us to uh, better maintain the health and proliferative potential of the exposed airway cells, and we hope that this will result in a more efficient uh, gene gene editing uh, with our populations moving forward. We're also interested in asking whether uh, these types of epithelial modulating particles can effectively package and deliver gene editing cargos for single for single step correction, or whether it we might have to move towards an effect uh, a, whether it might, it might it might be more effective to apply maybe a two particle strategy where we use epithelial modifying uh, particles as a pretreatment to expose the airway stem cells uh, and ultimately follow that with a second uh, CRISPR-Cas9 loaded nanopore carrier. Um, to complement this work, uh, we are in parallel uh, surveying uh, whether other functionalities to the nanoparticles, such as the incorporation of, of moieties like lys lysophosphatidylcholine, uh, may be more effective and less harsh on the airway uh, as, as the polydocanol. And as uh, uh, has been demonstrated, as uh, which you know uh, has really been more recently demonstrated uh, to improve lentiviral transduction of the airway epithelium in mouse models, and work uh, done by uh, Martin Donnelly and his group in Australia. Uh, we're currently assembling, uh, uh, the, uh, assessing the capabilities of the lip lipid nanoparticles uh, that integrate LPC. Uh, and comparing them to our polydocanol nanoparticles and evaluating both the packaging and delivery capabilities uh, of these formulations. And so more news on that as, uh, as that develops. And to so, sum up, uh, we are in really in the early stages of a lot of this work, as, as you can imagine. And we've admittedly still have a long way to go, uh, but given that there's so many opportunities for cell-based therapies uh, to be applied across the spectrum of children's health, uh, our hope is really that by optimizing the cargos, uh, the packaging, and the delivery uh, 
of gene editing reagents to airway stem cells that we can help to provide uh, a set of broadly applicable tools and intercellular delivery technologies that can offer the CF research community new capabilities to accelerate the development of uh, more effective uh, gene therapies moving forward. And so I've been fortunate enough to work with a great team of senior colleagues and, and young scientists who I've tried to uh, my best to highlight along uh, the way during this talk and to be generously supported to explore this uh, these some of these these ideas by the CFRI uh, uh, and uh, among other uh, great foundations and, and organizations. Uh, and obviously, please forgive the shameless plug, but as a young growing research group, we would love to bring in new people to the team. And uh, if you happen to know folks who are graduating and might be interested in, in crossing disciplines with us, uh, you know, please send them our way. And thank you for your attention. We'd be happy to uh, uh, take any questions. I see there are a couple in the chat um, that we can kind of look through. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I had a quick question. Um, you, you said in the very beginning of your talk that you're not that happy with your T84 cells. Yeah. Um, that cell line. Can you just briefly talk about what's going on with that? Um, you know, for in our hands, and maybe we're just, uh, it's just teaching engineers how to, uh, uh, how to work with, 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 with uh, biology. Um, they tend to be very difficult to uh, uh, harvest from plates. They're really adherent. And that really kind of impacts our kind of downstream assays kind of as we move forward. And so we would love a better system that uh, will, uh, be more kind to our to our students uh, as they collect their their uh, the cells for their analyses. Got it. Got it. Okay. Devin has a couple questions in here. Um, mm -hmm. How does he might he says I might have missed this, so I'm sorry. Yeah. But how does nanotechnology as a delivery vector compare to other methods like viral? I'm curious what the pros and cons are. Yeah. No, Devin, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think. As I said before, I don't think uh, the, the point is to uh, completely uh, trash any kind of system. I think uh, both have, they, as you pointed out, they all have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, in terms of uh, nano uh, particle-based carriers, uh, the advantages that we see are that you have a little bit more flexibility in the types of cargo that you can load into them and the cargo carrying capacity. Um, different types of viral vectors are uh, have uh, intrinsic size limits uh, that nanoparticles can can somewhat um, uh, avoid, uh, as well as uh, they're a lot cheaper to make. Um, GMP grade viral vectors are, are are very expensive, which owes to uh, uh, the incredible costs that are associated with current gene therapies right now. Uh, nanoparticle based syntheses uh, could maybe bring those costs down and hopefully um, uh, enable. Uh, more people to have access to these uh, these types of uh, uh, therapeutic interventions moving forward. Great. And Devin has another uh, question. Do the liquid nanoparticles need to be stored at minus 69 degrees or um, like the COVID vaccines needed to be? Um, uh, it's a, a, yeah, I mean, it, uh, it depends uh, on the system. We have tended to store them. We've been looking at that. Um, they tend to have a shelf life at room temperature of uh, uh, about a week in our hands, um, but you know, obviously, storage with, in in with the with the, the colder conditions will help uh, extend that. Um, but uh, uh, it's ultimately going to depend on uh, whether or not you're exploring a like an off the shelf solution uh, where you can just grab uh, a a a. Uh, a set of particles uh, from the freezer and deliver it to a, a patient, or if uh, you're looking at it in terms of uh, making the particles fresh on the day of of, of delivery. Um, and so, uh, as this kind of these types of clinical approaches kind of mature, I think those are those are definitely things that we have to kind of consider. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. Krista Eisen has a couple. Do you anticipate less stem cell research with recent law changes? Oh, I think she's thinking of different stem cells. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Uh, go ahead. This is cell line. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, uh, the 
in, in Cal, in, we're lucky enough in California that we are uh, uh, in a in a state that is allows us to uh, um, uh, and provides resources to you know different groups to explore different areas of stem cell biology. Um, you know the the airway basal stem cells that we work with um, are uh, from de-identified sources and um, are commercially available, and so they are technically um, uh, not. Uh, really uh, applicable to the uh, kind of the ethical issues that have been uh, associated with the use of uh, uh, different types of uh, fetal type tissues. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And we have a couple questions regarding sort of the barrier to entry. Um, one about mucus, uh, the, is the mucus barrier reduced with modulators and how would that affect your strategy? You know, I think that's a good question. Um, I have not thought about that actually. Uh, I'm not a I'm a pediatric oncologist, so I uh, have not uh, uh, taken care of a CF patient in in that context in a while. But I would love to ask my my colleagues on the pulmonary pulmonology front to see whether or not there is a significant effect on the mucus uh, barrier, and if we can uh, exploit that as a way to maybe pretreat for our, our particles moving forward, and maybe hopefully uh, expose. Uh, uh, that coupled with our uh, epithelial modulating um, uh, particles can expose more uh, airway basal stem cells to correction. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I can tell you from first person experience, there's certainly less mucus. <laughs> yeah, so I guess uh, <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, Allison Allen says, uh, wouldn't the polydocanol cause more inflammation? since it's causing injury. And I had a similar question about like, how transient is this damage? And is this even feasible clinically to damage the airway like that? So that's what uh, we're kind of looking at. We're hoping to explore a little bit more further as we kind of move from in vitro to uh, in vivo models, at least with um, this initial pilot study that we've done um, with the ALIs, uh, the ALI uh, looks like it's uh, recovered after about uh, a day, uh, or 20, between 24 hours and 48 hours, uh, relative to you know uh, basically the uh, the the polydocanol that's delivered neat, um, which has more extensive and more permanent damage. Mm -hmm. So we're we're hoping that you know we are we can fine tune um, that delivery to the extent where we can kind of minimize that local injury and have it so that we can actually access the stem cells, but not produce enough, so much injury that we ultimately create a more pressing clinical problem. That's kind of the, the going to be the art, I think, moving forward, if we want to really gain access to the to the types of cells that we think we need to target. That um, raises another question that I had, um, and I probably missed this. You you said a lot of stuff really Yeah, fast. sorry, I was going fast and <laughs> blabbing Is a little bit. Is there some kind of surface receptor that you're targeting on a basal cell that, you know, that the, the nanoparticles are targeting? Like what attracts them to the basal cell? The That's... Stem cell? So yeah, that's a good question. I think that's our next grant, to be honest with you. Um, right now, we are we are we're we're uh, uh, we're going blind um, with the particles, and uh, Bridget's group is is really working uh, with colleagues at the the uh, from the Cystic Fibrosis uh, uh, Foundation um, to uh, identify different markers that we might uh, use to. Uh, add the targeting capability to to the stem cells. Um, I think she has some ideas for that, but it, it's something that we're kind of brainstorming right now. Right now, we're just we're we're basically uh, at the phase of assessing um, uh, uh, the loading capacity and the ability to really package the right kind of gene editing reagents. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for Q and A. Thank you very much, Dr. Jonas, for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. We're going to now take a short 15-minute break, and we'll be back for the next presentation at 3.50. So come on back for Sriram Vaidyanathan. <laughs>